Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Inner Products and Norms. Recall that V denotes an inner product space. We now define the norm on an inner product space by defining the norm of a vector to be the square root of the vector inner product with itself. Because a vector inner product with itself is a non-negative number, of course we mean the non-negative square root here. Let's look at some examples. Our first example, we have the vector space Fn with the standard inner product, in which case the norm of a vector is the square root of the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coordinates. When we're working with Fn, unless stated otherwise, we will assume that the inner product is the standard Euclidean inner product. In other words, the inner product of two vectors is obtained by multiplying the coordinates together, taking the complex conjugate of the second one, in the case of the complex scalar field, and then adding up those products. If our vector space is the vector space of continuous real-valued functions on the closed interval 0, 1, with the inner product being given by the integral of the product of the two functions, then we have that the norm is of a function f is the square root of the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f squared. Here are two basic properties of the norm. Suppose we have a vector v in our inner product space v. First property states that the norm of v is equal to 0 if and only if v is the 0 vector. This holds because in an inner product space, v inner product v equals 0, if and only if v is equal to 0. The second property states that the norm of a scalar times v is the absolute value of that scalar times the norm of v. Let's prove that one. Suppose lambda is a scalar in our scalar field f, and let's look at the norm of lambda v squared. Before we go on with the calculation, one important point to note. When dealing with norms, it's almost always easier to work with norm squared, as we are doing here. At any rate, the norm squared of lambda times v is equal to lambda times v inner product with itself. Now, let's use homogeneity in the first slot to bring that first lambda outside, as we've done in the second equation. Now we use conjugate homogeneity in the second slot to bring out the complex conjugate of lambda, as shown here in the third equation. Note that if our scalar field is the real numbers, then lambda bar is just lambda, but it doesn't hurt to put the bar there. Now we use the equation that the absolute value of lambda squared is equal to lambda times this complex conjugate to get this fourth equation. Finally, take square roots of both sides to give the desired equality that the norm of lambda v is equal to the absolute value of lambda times the norm of v. Two vectors are called orthogonal if their inner product equals zero. The word orthogonal is just a fancy word that really means perpendicular. In the special case of R2, the dot product of two vectors is equal to the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them. Of course, the cosine of an angle is equal to zero if and only if the angle equals pi over two radians, or 90 degrees. Thus, in R2, the inner product of two vectors is equal to zero if and only if the two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular in the usual sense. Here are two simple properties of orthogonality. Zero is orthogonal to every vector in V. That means that u inner product zero is equal to zero for every vector. That's obvious from our definition. And furthermore, second property, zero is the only vector that is orthogonal to itself. That's because the inner product of a vector with itself equals zero if and only if the vector is equal to zero. Now we come to a result that is over 2,500 years old. The Pythagorean theorem states that if we have two orthogonal vectors, then the norm squared of their sum is the sum of the norm squareds of the two vectors. The proof that we are about to give is way different from the original proof. 
Suppose u and v are orthogonal vectors in our inner product space v. Let's look at the norm squared of u plus v, which of course is equal to u plus v inner product with itself. Now expand that inner product using the additivity properties, and we get what you see on the second line, the inner product of u with itself, plus the inner product of u with v, plus the inner product of v with u, plus the inner product of v with itself. Now the inner product of u with itself is the norm of u squared. The inner product of u with v is zero because u and v are orthogonal. The inner product of v with u is also zero because v and u are orthogonal, or just take the complex conjugate of the statement that u inner product v equals zero. And finally, the inner product of v with itself is the norm of v squared. This completes the proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Because we've been talking about the Pythagorean theorem, let's pause for a moment to look at this beautiful painting of a woman teaching geometry. This painting comes from a 14th century edition of Euclid's famous geometry book. Now we come to what may be the most important inequality in mathematics, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. <laughs> The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality states that the absolute value of the inner product of two vectors is less than or equal to the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second vector. Furthermore, this inequality is an equality if and only if one of the vectors is a scalar multiple of the other one. By choosing different inner products, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality becomes different useful inequalities. Let's look at some examples. For our first example, we'll use the standard Euclidean inner product on Rn. In that case, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality becomes the equality that you see displayed here. Notice that this inequality is actually the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality squared, meaning we have squared both sides. Thus, the left-hand side of what you're seeing is the square of the inner product of two vectors, and the right-hand side is the norm of the first vector squared times the norm of the second vector squared. For our second example, consider the inner product space consisting of the continuous real-valued functions on the closed interval from minus 1 to 1, with the inner product of two functions being the integral from minus 1 to 1 of their product. In that case, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality becomes the inequality you see here, where again, both sides have been squared, just to make things a little easier to read. If you try proving either of the inequalities displayed in these two bullet points using just bare hands, you'll see that it's quite difficult. This shows the power of the abstract approach of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. The proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is not difficult, but it's more appropriate for you to read it than to see it in a video. Thus, please be sure to look at the proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in the book. One very useful consequence of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality says that in an inner product space, the norm of the sum of any two vectors is less than or equal to the sum of the norms. Furthermore, that inequality is an equality if and only if one of the vectors is a non-negative multiple of the other vector. This inequality is called the triangle inequality because of the picture that you now see. The interpretation of the triangle inequality is that in any triangle, the length of any one side is less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of the other two sides. Let's look at the proof of the triangle inequality. Suppose u and v are vectors in our inner product space v. We want to look at the norm of u plus v but as usual, it's easier to look at the norm squared. The norm squared of u plus v is equal to u plus v inner product with itself. Now just expand that using the additivity properties, and we get the expression shown in the second equation here. For our third equation, we rewrite the last term by using the property that interchanging the order of the inner products gives us the complex conjugate. If we look at the third equation, we see the last two terms 
are the inner product of u with v and the complex conjugate of the inner product of u with v. Now for any complex number, the complex number plus its complex conjugate is 2 times the real part. That gives us the fourth equation shown here. The real part of any complex number is less than or equal to the absolute value of the complex number. Using that inequality, we get the fifth line shown here. Now use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which says the absolute value of the inner product of u with v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v, giving us the inequality now shown. Finally, we can rewrite the last expression as the norm of u plus the norm of v squared. And now the proof of the triangle inequality is completed simply by taking the square roots of both sides. You can see when the triangle inequality is actually inequality by seeing when the two inequalities above become equalities. You can check the details in the book. Our last result in this video is called the parallelogram equality. It says that if u and v are any vectors in our inner product space v, then the norm of u plus v squared plus the norm of u minus v squared is equal to twice the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. This equality is called the parallelogram equality because of the picture now shown. In this picture, we have a parallelogram. Two sides of this parallelogram are represented by the vector u, and the other two parallel sides are represented by the vector v. The two diagonals of this parallelogram are u plus v and u minus v, as you should verify. Thus, what the parallelogram equality says is that in any parallelogram, the sum of the squares of the lengths of the diagonals is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of all four sides. A nice result. Let's look at the proof of the parallelogram equality. We start with the left-hand side, the norm of u plus v squared plus the norm of u minus v squared. And as usual, we write norm squared as the vectors inner product with themselves. Now just expand using the additivity property to get the equation now shown in red. We have some nice cancellation in this equation, giving us the result quite easily. This concludes part two of the video on inner products and norms.